Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Catalyst Energies. My name is Dee. Thank you for joining me. I am so grateful that you are here. Welcome to the Daily Medicine Transmission. It is April 20th, 420, 2022. Welcome back, everyone. If you're new here, welcome. Thanks for stopping by. Um, as always, when you subscribe, you like, you share, you comment on this video, I'll remind you again. Um, it does actually influence the algorithm. It allows this um, content to be recommended to more people, to uh, bring more people into the Starseed Ministry. And uh, hello to the Starseed Fellowship. We're going to be meeting today on Zoom at 2.30 p.m. Eastern. That link is posted on Subscribestar and it's posted on our private Telegram chat group. So if you're interested and you are a subscriber and you want to be able to join us for that, that um, is linked on Subscribestar. And if you want to know what the Starseed Ministry is all about, there's actually a handy video in the description box below that's linked that you can check out. Just a quick video to give you um, an idea of what it's all about. So uh, welcome to Taurus season, my friends. The sun has moved officially into Taurus. And um, wow, the message coming through today is um, very strong. Of course, um, with Taurus in mind, that is, in fact, very strong, very stable. Um, it represents fertility. It represents patience. Uh, all these Taurus qualities in terms of astrology, archetypes, symbolism. It is the medium of our growth. It is the living soil. It is the material um, world around us and our objective reality, which we are inseparable from. Does that mean we are that? Um, no. In fact, we are, uh, we are the emergence of the seed within the soil. But right now, as the sun has moved into Taurus, we are strongly uh, starting to identify with the world around us, the world of value, the world of worth, right? And so Taurus um, covers a lot of themes, but when it comes down to it, it is truly about comfort, security in a material way and balance. Um, so it's very important, and the message is coming through loud and clear this morning, just for myself and for everyone who has access to this content today, um, to simply just be yourself. It's really important that we identify our isness and that we be it. And being our isness absolutely requires in this uh, density, in this dimension of reality, that we are embedded in the medium of our growth. And with the sun in Taurus, with Uranus in Taurus, with Mercury in Taurus, with the north node of the moon in Taurus, um, there's a lot of strong pull, drive, um, awakening potential. And now with Mercury um, here and the sun, uh, a lot of identification, mental um, connection with this realm of the world around us, the, the realm of worth and value, intrinsic worth and value. So lots of themes that fill in Taurus and the second house in astrology that we will look into. So what rules um, Taurus, much like a natal chart, when we see the sign that the sun is in, we want to look to that sign's ruling planet to really, um, you know, add another layer of understanding. And it's Venus, Venus and Pisces. So as we see on this gorgeous uh, photography, many people have actually posted similar uh, photographs. Um, and you are seeing this beautiful longitudinal alignment um, with Jupiter, Venus, Mars, and Saturn. So Saturn in Aquarius, the last degrees of Aquarius, it's going to station retrograde here, by the way, um, very soon this summer. Mars in uh, the very, just dipped into Pisces very recently. Venus that is halfway through Pisces and Jupiter, which is at the last couple of degrees of Pisces. And so they, they are fairly aligned, even though they may have a 30 degrees um, between Saturn and Jupiter in, in the grand scheme of things. This is a beautiful alignment, um, clear skies in order to see all of these. And Saturn is really the last planet you can see with the, with the naked eye. And if you ever get a chance to see it through a telescope, it's kind of mind blowing because you get to see it in its um, much more in its entirety um, with all of the uh, the rings, you can see much more of its actual structure rather than this tiny little blip here. So um, this is this is gorgeous. And it, you know, it looks like a spine, right? It looks like um, something that is 
anchoring us, but also too is uh, creating a structure, um, creating some sort of scaffolding. And considering the fact that all three of these planets are in Pisces in particular, it seems like it is much more of a spiritual spine and a sense of where we really belong within the midst of this entire journey, this spiritual journey, this soul journey. So um, in evolutionary astrology, the idea is that the soul is on its own evolutionary journey and in incarnation um, into form, regardless of where it's at, earth or anywhere else. And as a star seed, that it's definitely lots of other places as well, that it is um, for the sake of the soul's evolution that we go through incarnation after incarnation. Now, um, that really does have, you know, there's some conversations we can have about, um, you know, souls being trapped here. What does reincarnation mean on earth and third density? Um, how does that factor into reincarnation um, that is intentional or as a star seed? These are all really uh, great questions. These are things that I think about myself often and are things that we often talk about in the star seed fellowship um, because it's a space where people can actually um, start to bring their questions and their considerations forward rather than relying on the inputs exclusively of other people to um, influence us, right? And there's a reason... Um, content creators and online influencers. That's not an accident. So, I mean, by God, it's just like rubbed in our face all the time. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's get into the sun, actually for today, because uh, speaking of the sun coming in Taurus and simply being ourselves and uh, being and being real with ourselves, right? There is um, some interesting developments here in terms of what our sun is doing. So we're going to exit out of his here. I'm going to look at, oh, well, there's our chart for today. Of course, we will look at our 420 chart. But uh, the thing that I want to bring up, let's start actually with spaceweather.com because this is kind of uh, the thing that I want to bring up. So spaceweather weather.com. You can see right there. This is information that's very easily accessible to anyone through even Google, because um, this is much more of the NASA run uh, space weather site. But what we're going to look at here is that the sun has been flaring a lot in the last, you know, 24 hours. And as, according to spaceweather.com, it's flared 19 times. And some of them have been larger M class and this X class solar flare that you see right here that's going off. Well, this is like right on the edge before this particular sunspot moves out of range of the earth, right? As it's turning away, it uh, has this very large X class solar flare. It did have an impact on um, radio waves here on the planet. But what we're going to find with the Schumann is, um, you know, it is, there's definitely still some amplification, but you can see that it's starting to become less loud. Um, and I think that's interesting in and of itself, considering the fact that there is a massive complex of, um, of sunspots that also have been flaring that are about to come into view. Now they have been relatively quiet in terms of flare activity, right? There are smaller flares. There may have been a lot of them, but they have been small. So we're going to see when it turns into view, what's going to be happening. But when this X class solar flare happened, we're going to see on the Schumann there wasn't that much of an impact, even though this is a very large impact. So there is an expectation there's going to be a CME because there was a radio, uh, shortwave radio blackout suggesting that there was enough of a blast that there is stuff coming our way. Whether or not that has an impact on us um, at that point, we'll see what happens. One thing I will say, though, is that as we look at... Um, the geomagnetic activity in general, here's another one, uh, another one of these beautiful photographies uh, or photographs of um, f photography offerings, let's put it that way. Um, what we do see is that the KP index is quiet and quiet, right? There's no coronal, there's no significant coronal holes facing us, right? That means that the geomagnetic um, disturbance is going to get very balanced. Um, and what does that also mean? Well, that also means that the instance of um, possibly cosmic rays is it may start to go up. And when we look at uh, spaceweathernews.com, this is for suspicious observers. Um, 
well, run by suspicious observers, let's put it that way. Uh, you can even see here that the solar wind speed is decreasing, um, that the temperature is decreasing, that the uh, phi angle is starting to get closer together in its flipping, right? It's starting to settle. Um, and even the geomagnetic disturbance, this red line here is starting to settle out. So what does that mean? That means that the um, geomagnetosphere uh, is fairly calm and it got a lot calmer yesterday and then it amped up again and now it's starting to taper a little bit. So we're going to see what happens. Do we get hit with more CMEs? Is that sunspot group going to flare off really strongly as it points towards us and we get massive impact? We're going to find out. Um, I, I tend to think that we probably will, but it hasn't, you know, it's important to stay as um, open-minded and observing as possible rather than getting caught up in an expectation because guess what? We are responsible for creating everything around us, right? And, you know, somebody at one point here, we'll, we'll move on to the Schumann so you can see it. At one point, somebody had made a comment um, about how Suspicious Observers has a really large... Um, you know, subscriber count on YouTube and they haven't been taken off yet and why that is if they seem to be, um, you know, really, really um, presenting information that has been suppressed for a long time, at least through, um, you know, official channels. And but why are they still there? And I know that there's been uh, concern on their part of being kicked off, but they still have it and they have a huge subscriber base. Well, number one, it's all about money, right? I mean, the advertising revenue alone for YouTube is worth it. And um, but I really think part of it is because as as incredibly informative and important this work is and how much we're learning from it. There's no talk about how the human uh, consciousness has a relationship with the planet and there may very well be um, a way that we can interact and um, have an impact on these cycles and we haven't so far in the way that we um, have been studying them but that doesn't mean that we can't and I think that's why there's no sense of solution here um, with this information there is only an inevitable conclusion and I'm not suggesting that there won't be some type of natural, um, you know, a very natural but very powerful cycle that has been playing itself out for a very long time. But it also suggests that there's nothing we can do about it. And is that true? Um I don't know. I tend to think that we're going to really address this issue um, over the next couple of weeks as the sun's in Taurus. And we are identifying not with our own subjective sense of self, but with the world around us and the world of value and worth and the natural resonance of the planet, of um the solar system, the sun, all of these relationships are part of um, the ability to, well, they're, they're experienced, I think, in Taurus. And Venus, being the ruler of Taurus, is often um, related to relationships and not so much relationships. And that's also because she rules Libra. But it's her sensitivity to her own feelings and her own um, sense of who she is and what she wants that allows us to be sensitive to relationships in the first place. So I don't know. These are just questions that I ask, right? But what I will tell you is that there was an X-class solar flare and the Schumann didn't really blip that much. It did go up, but not like it's been. Not like it's been. And I don't know if that's because there's no coronal hole stream, no solar wind at the same time. I don't know if there is a calming in relation to, um, you know, the impact of these solar flares from the Earth's perspective now. I mean, the heartbeat of the planet has, you know, increases, right? And then the field gets stronger, it gets louder. So who knows? We're just going to have to wait and see. But I do get a sense that um, there's been some big, massive purging still, right? And it's important that we are allowing ourselves to be ourselves during this time, because it's in our feelings that we are getting our, our, our direction, right? They're, they're the they're the coordinates on our soul's map, just like the astrology, for um, what we are feeling in our gut, right? And Taurus also rules the gut, the instinct. And as we can see here, there's a lot of energy here 
in Taurus now. And it's time to start identifying with our instinct, our, our gut intuition of the world around us, as opposed to the signals that are, um, being, you know, constantly thrown at us and we are being bombarded by, and that's from, you know, that is from one end of the spectrum of the other in terms of information, right? If it is got the doom and gloom resonance, if it has, if it's, and this is, you know, from that Alex Collier webinar, he said the same thing. And I tend to agree with it. If it's got the doom and gloom, um, and it's impact, if it's not empowering you, then chances are it's trying to draw out, um, that particular resonance of fear and imbalance. But if it's empowering, it's still truth and it's still difficult, but you feel empowered by knowing that, then that's a different story that allows you to be a conscious co-creator of this experience. So this is going to become way more of a theme now that the sun is in Taurus. So let's kind of backtrack to the very beginning of the 20th, right? Um, at midnight Eastern standard time, because we see that the moon and in Sagittarius is in a square to Venus in Pisces. So we do want to track Venus now that the sun is in Taurus, just like when the sun was in Aries, really tracking what Mars was doing was really assisting us in um, how we identified with this type of cardinal fire energy. Now that the sun is in Taurus, when we look to Venus in Pisces, it gives us an idea how we can, you know, identify with this much more, uh, you know, when I say sensual, it really is based on the senses, right? The five, maybe six or more senses. And I would say part of our transition density wise means that more of these senses come online and become part of the canon, right? Become part of just what we know as our senses. So you'll find that there'll probably be more like five, six, seven, eight senses as opposed to just the five. So, and Venus and Pisces is a is quite the conduit for this, right? Because it's through our own embodiment with Venus as the representative that we are able to, um, interact with the world around us. And when she's in Pisces, the, the, yes, the boundaries are much more fluid and soft and they have, you know, there's, it's much more like being an island surrounded by the collective unconscious feels. And that has had, um, quite a bit of impact on many of us, either in our physical bodies, in the way we're expressing our emotions in some ways, because it's, that's a little bit more difficult to, um, be in such close close communion with the collective unconscious and the transcendental, the cosmic, um, even just the, the, the magnetic field of the entire, uh, human collective. It's, it's not been easy, but and the moon and Sag, now that it's coming into the last, uh, that the second half of Sagittarius, where it's about transference, um, rather than the abstraction, it it's, the strength still is being drawn from this sense of collective meaning and value and big picture. And there oftentimes we'll find that we will follow the easier meal when it comes to our own psyche, rather than doing the work of diving into, um, the ocean of consciousness itself in order to get our sustenance. And so the Sabian symbol here of 16 degrees Sag is, you know, there's this huge barge or a ship and the seagulls are hovering and flying behind it. And because there's the easy meal off the ship rather than doing the naturally, um, conditioned thing for the seagull to live close to the water and dive in. And this is not a fault of the seagull. This is just a nature of, uh, living in nature, right? That you will do what you, it's just like bears that will come into the campsites. The more that there are, um, you know, the more that food is being left out or garbage cans. When I was a kid, right, we still burned our trash. When I was, and a lot of people still do, by the way, um, where I'm at in the rural areas, but we burned most of our trash when I was a kid. And so the, the bear was always in the burn barrel when I was a kid. So, um, again, it's just where the easy meal is. It's a, it's, it's part of, um, the nature of reality for material, life. So remember that as we are identifying with the medium of our, um, environment and objective reality, because when you have the sun in the second house in general, 
there's there's a tendency here to um, start identifying oneself with that which is the material reality, which then can really, well, I would say that it could lead one to get lost in the collective energies and kind of lose a sense of self. So that's something to consider as well. And so when you have the moon and Sag and you're just like, oh, there's, there is my, my psyche is being drawn to this, um, you know, to the sustenance because, um, it's just easier this way. You don't even think about it. It's just instinct. Go after what is available. What is the least amount, you know, the path of least resistance. This square to Venus, I think is very important in, in that, um, you know, this is about finding that quiet within. And again, this is about simply being oneself through this time in Taurus. And it starts with this square of, of, of discomfort of, having in your own, in your own sense of who you are, but also in your, in your feelings, in your senses, in the state of your connection to everything around you. This is about finding some quiet and some solitude in order to receive inspiration. Whereas the, the, the moon and Sag in this square, you know, this conflict here that we kind of have to lean into is the feeling of like, but I, but I'm going after something. I need to sustain myself. And this seems to be, um, at least in my read and in my experience right now, it seems to still, um, kind of reflect, uh, where we have been, you know, what has been going on in terms of being led down, you know, led in a certain direction through the transference of abstract sy symbols, right? And that can, that, that's anything from literal symbolism to stories, mythologies, narratives, doctrines of belief, religious, um, religious dogma, philosophies. These are all Sagittarian types of things because they cover the big picture. And, um, if the big picture is something that is just already been presented and you're following along with it, yeah, you're going to feel a disturbance in your own body and a sense of value and worth when it comes to just sitting with it, finding quiet, being inspired by what's just around you. And so if you're, I, I feel like this is starting to come to, um, a real awareness. And this is a little bit of that, like, oh yeah, the, the, the tension there, right? The square of just like, no, I got to keep going, keep going, keep going, go after this, go after this, go after this, rather than realizing that you just dive in and get your meal at your leisure. But it's not as easy. It takes work. And so in this instance, this is much more about, like I said, finding that quiet moment in order to um, establish and experience some inspiration. So now the moon comes into a quincunx with Mercury in Taurus. Now I started doing, um, I started preparing the report and the content for the next eclipse cycle, right? So this is going to be, um, starting at the end of this month and going out to October and November where there is the next, um, set of eclipses. So I'm covering the time frame, And one of the things that's going to be happening this summer is that Uranus and the North node are going to come into a conjunction at 19 degrees of Taurus. Okay. Um, this is where Uranus is going to station retrograde as well. Um, and this is actually where Mercury will be in a quincunx to the moon, um, in a little, like it had been overnight, let's put it that way. So if we go forward just a little bit here, okay. But what it moves in terms of Mercury, it moves into position. It moves into position where Uranus and the North Node are going to be conjunct. This is on the 31st of July. So if you had the Bloom readings, then you know that July 11th is when we reach our true Pluto return of the U.S. based on um, the retrograde of Pluto. You know that right after that, there is a full moon. And then at the end of July, these two elements come together. And I'm going to read the Sabian symbol for you because it's really, <laughs> it's really really important to understand um, how it may um, unfold for us um, in our own process, but you, it's going to materialize some way outside, right? Uranus is shock and all unexpected changes, right? Um, sometimes it's a psychological crisis, but it always is the trigger for self-renewal, freedom, innovation, and um, 
and, and, and awakening, right? Truly. And we talked about that harmonic, right? We already got a sense of where it's going and where we are now and how those two things are linked. And so when Uranus and the North Node come together, I mean, this is um, a very a very powerful rising, right? This is literally a new continent rising from the ocean. That is the Sabian symbol. So let's backtrack to here now. So Mercury will be in um, this position today. So keep in mind that the uh, cognitive and mental faculties, right? Mercury that allows us to travel, um, uh, you know, through the realm of the digital, right? Through the realm of information, analog or digital, it doesn't matter. It is the flow and the movement of information back and forth. This is going to be reaching this moment. So you may find that um, this sense of this new continent rising, this spontaneous emergence um, out of the collective unconscious is something that is going to start showing itself um, in our own mind, our own conception right now. So right before this happens, the moon was in a quincunx to Mercury. And it, again, the sense with the moon in late Sagittarius, which will be crossing the galactic center, by the way, today, which is a huge starseed activation. Um, it's a starseed activation for Arcturus and Andromeda in particular and, and Orion, all three of them. While... While we may um, look to, again, some sort of like mediation from the culture, from the belief system, it doesn't matter what the belief system, let's just say it, the narrative. The narrative is kind of shielding us from direct exposure to the sun or illumination or rebirth. And um, we may feel like we need that. Um, we may literally with the, uh, the moon in Sagittarius, the quincunx to Mercury, right? The adjustment that has to be made in this moment is that... Um, uh, when we're airing, you know, when our mind, we're airing out our own consciousness, um, and purifying it, just like we're airing out a bag through an open window or something. Um, when that's happening, um, what is, what needs to be adjusted from within us, right? Perhaps that narrative isn't going to be able to actually, you know, protect us from the sunstroke anymore. Um, perhaps there is, um, a sense of having to take that uh, sun hat off. I'm, I'm using symbolism here based on the Sabian symbols, but the idea here is that the culture will simultaneously protect and mitigate um, and modulate um, experience, spiritual experience, but it also can be very controlling and keep people dampened. So I, I just think the adjustment is that while we may be still relying on this narrative to keep us from, from collectively having this exposure emotionally, right? This is about the moon. This is how we're going to feel. It's the, it's the quincunx to Mercury that is like airing out our own mind in this moment. We will have to adjust ourselves because it's going to kind of throw that protective mechanism off of our crown chakra. And it's just open. It's just open, Right. It's not necessarily, it, it, the conflict is just in the way we have to adjust ourselves in that moment, okay? And then Mercury will eventually move into that degree of, uh, that degree of Taurus. And I am going to read the Sabian symbol as a way of kind of wrapping up. So you can kind of see that even now the seeds are being planted, the, um, the mental energy of that is truly how we are able to ultimately manifest is it, it's such a huge part of it. it. It's really our thoughts that are the manifestation of our soul in relation to, um, the, the world around us. It is our own thoughts that show us what is manifesting already, what template already exists. So just keep that in mind um, as, as we go through the rest of these moon transits and the months ahead, right? Knowing that Uranus and the North Node are going to meet at this degree, right? This is our soul's journey. This is where we're being pulled, the dragon of our soul um, and where we want to evolve to collectively is going to meet the agent of very radical and rapid change. Um, and you may, we may find that something very drastic happens at a fundamentally earth-based level, that something new rises out of the collective unconscious. And it's just now we're, we're, we're mentally, um, able to access it, I would say. So, the moon also comes into, uh, speaking of quincunxes again, is going to 
come into a quincunx with Rahu. Speaking of um, <laughs> speaking of our destiny and our soul's growth, um, is going to come into a quincunx with Rahu. Another adjustment moment that happens this morning, and this is really about uh, uh, the experience of growth uh, and and not even growth but development of value and worth strictly based on time right the idea that um you know the gems the valuable gems that we identify as valuable whatever they are um be them physical or um you know I, in terms of ideas, in terms of whatever's valuable to us in our life, you can see them as gems and, um, they, they become gems based on an experience of time. It's based on an experience of being embedded in the world and, um, interacting with the environment. And it's us that just certifies that, uh, value through some type of, uh, some type of, uh, gesture, I suppose. And this is the, the pathway of our soul's growth and learning right now is in this natural experience. And again, the moon in a quincunx from Sagittarius is, is, is much, I, I feel like that we are so ready. We are so ready. We have, we are so ready to act on the narrative that we believe. We are so ready to step forward into this new situation, this new realm. We are so ready ready to fulfill whatever requirements are asked or, or, um, expected of us as we go into this new realm. We're so, so ready and we are like, and we feel ready. And again, we have to just adjust ourselves, um, as the soul, the collective soul is much more embedded in the Pleiadian nature that really is about balance is about the, f um, open heart, right? Just like the, the planet, an open heart, a strong field. Um, and that in alignment with this, the value comes on its own. And so again, there's, we don't want to, it's not about jumping the gun necessarily, but there will be such a strong feeling of like, okay, this, I I'm ready to go, right. I'm ready to go and do what needs to be done. And it reminds me in the movie contact when, um, uh, the main character is about to go through the wormhole and it's, uh, it's powering up and she keeps repeating over and over. I'm good to go. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. That's what it feels like. Um, and we just, we're about to go through this wormhole that we don't have any control over what's happening in it, but we know that it is, we're being pulled in this direction. So again, we just have to adjust ourselves in this moment. We're not all going to like, um, we still have to allow for this process to unfold naturally. So it doesn't mean you're complacent. It just means that you aren't necessarily, you know, as much as we feel this way, it's not going to, um, it's not quite here yet, but we can, we can conceptualize it mentally. Mercury is allowing this for, to happen. So the moon comes into, um, sorry guys, a sextile then right after this with Saturn, Saturn and Aquarius. Remember we saw Saturn at the top of those photographs in the sky in terms of its alignment with everything else. Saturn in Aquarius, still moving direct. And, um, this sextile, as you can see, um, boldly, uh, printed here on this chart is, allowing us to see where we really are going, like some sort of, uh, symbol or message or any type of synchronistic, like, hello, that says you're on, you know, to let you know that you're on your way, that you're on your way home, that there is everything waiting for you at, um, the gate of this cottage. And there's a little bluebird that's perched on there and is sextile to Saturn. It's really about, um, the discipline that we have really, really had to just accept in terms of, uh, our past experiences, how we have grown and developed and how it's shaped us and how we can communicate that to those who are now going through that experience of, um, the, the, 
you know, the passions that overwhelm people and whatever that means for you and how it has, um, you know, it's one thing to have a strong, passionate voice. It's another to put them together and to have one strong collective voice. And so there's been a sense of real discipline, a sense of almost limitation with Saturn. You know, we haven't been able to get past this. And in fact, this is exactly where we need to be right now. So the sextile implies that there is an, there is a harmonization that actually takes us to a new level um, with how we feel and that we are in fact heading to where we want to get to. And it's partly part of this is acknowledging and identifying the need to be very disciplined, to, to tap into these elder root system of Saturn in terms of um, our past experiences. And considering this is our starseed positions, um, in particular in a trine to Orion, um, and also, well, it opposite, the moon is opposite Orion, um, is all of this is, there's so many starseed positions all interacting in this one moment, but it does suggest here that many of us have already gone through some type of process at a soul level. And here in here now is, is applying that and finding uh, the best way to communicate that to those who are now going through it at a soul level for the first time, or maybe it's part of their soul journey to acknowledge this again, right? So, and we're getting, and we can feel a sense of where we're going and that influences each other, right? When we can really see, um, the, the, light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak, or the bird perched on the cottage of of the gate of the cottage that we're trying to get to, it actually gives us a sense of um, strength and a sense of who we, you know, what we're really working towards. And that again, gives us um, even more discipline, even more sense of, um, you know, wisdom and uh, standing in that wisdom rather than getting influenced by the passions again, right? This is, seems to be exactly, you know, Sagittarius is a very interesting sign because it is um, truly a, uh, about the belief systems and the narrative and the representation of that is Jupiter, right? And Jupiter is now in Pisces. Actually, let's, let's talk about that because right after this is where, um, the moon comes into a square with both Jupiter and Neptune in Pisces. So all these mutable squares today, which can really be helpful in terms of repositioning ourselves in the face of these conflicts. But also, um, if you're struggling with keeping, uh, yourself stationary or grounded. I mean, again, Saturn, Saturn is a big part of this. If you need something to kind of like, okay, this is where I am. And it can be a little bit of a bitter pill to swallow, or it could not be very fun, but it's very much um, a sense of this is your structure and form and it provides for your safety and security in some ways, right? Or it's authoritarian trying to control everything. So that's the other side of things too. Uh, the moon is in a square like right here to, um, Neptune. Here it is right here. I don't know what I was, I was still looking at Saturn. The moon is in a square to a Neptune first. And this is now we're getting into the moon in conjunction with the center of the galaxy. So we're still having all these star seed activations. Um, Neptune in Pisces also, I mean, this is big star seed activation as well. And as the moon is starting to cross the center of the galaxy, it squares Neptune and squares Jupiter, which again is this, this inner sense of anticipation of, um, you know, nobility really, um, you know, entering the, the, the battle with the flag, right. Really being, um, uh, internally really carrying the banner, um, and even acting in a way where we anticipate where we're, you know, what's coming out of all of this and the meaning of all of it. When you have the whole pattern of meaning in front of you, if the whole narrative is already set, if the story has been already told, then you are already, um, you're already know what's going to happen. You already have a sense of what you want to, um, uh, apply yourself to, and you will go into the, the battle with the banner, right? This is the moon right now, how we're feeling. And, and this, again, we're drawing a lot of strength from this place, right? This is the nine of wands, the moon in, um, the moon in Sagittarius. So, 
the squaring to Neptune and Jupiter, right? This is, <laughs> this has been a really strong purge, especially with Neptune right now, really soul catharsis, right? Triggering, um, this purification at a fundamentally cosmic level at a karmic level. We're talking about Pisces and Jupiter too, um, is, now kind of starting to split its influence, right? It's come into um, not only the Dharma and then purging out everything that is not going to allow us to stay centralized to that Dharma, but now everybody is starting to go off into their own direction, right? This is the time in Pisces where um, the, so, you know, the solidification starts to come together, right? The seed begins to be viable, the individual seed and all the creative individual experiences are starting to come off of Jupiter, which is interesting considering Jupiter just wants to keep expanding and expanding and expanding. So this is a little, if you are really pulled into the feeling of what Jupiter represents in Sagittarius, which is the big picture and the narrative and your belief systems and, um, you know, the pattern of meaning in and of itself, in its entirety, right? The, the, the big picture, if you are tapped into that, then, um, yeah, it's going to feel like you can't really divide your, the influence, right? How do you start to consolidate this, um, you know, representative of meaning and spiritual vision into a singular point of new creation? Well, especially when you are still, um, you know, still acting on the pattern of meaning that holds it all together, right? This has already come apart and coming into a new one at the end of Pisces. So, um, it's not to say again, that we don't have, uh, impact on what's going on or that we shouldn't be taking up the banner of our, of our belief system and go into battle. Um, what I'm suggesting here is that these are massive, uh, Neptune and Jupiter, uh, these are large cycles that are playing out that, um, have to do with more than just how we each individually feel. And we are going to bump up against that by the end of today. Doesn't mean that one side's better than the other. You don't just, you're not just apathetic, but you also don't want to necessarily burn yourself out because you're trying to, um, carry the banner into battle. And you're like, what is, you know, um, perhaps here, Perhaps it's important to realize that if we are trying to hold more than we actually can, we're more at risk of dropping a lot of things um, and not being able to carry that potential in its entirety into um, into the next uh, into the medium for it to grow, right? And this is because the moon will be in a trine to Pallas Athena, um, and this is a big star seed one, right? Because the moon will be at 26 degrees of Sagittarius in a square to Jupiter and Pallas Athena is at 26 degrees Aries. And so she is in a conjunction with um, Andromeda. So um, part of it is to be free, free in yourself, not so much in picking up the banner of a belief system or a narrative that you don't even, I mean, here's the thing, like narratives are important, but remember we just went through two, you know, a year and a half of the South Node in Sagittarius, right? Um, and the North Node in Gemini, where we're collecting data, more knowledge, new knowledge, learning new things. Um, and now we are um, evolving by going even more into our instinct now, not so much in the social mechanism for creating security um, or provision or reality, right? And so if we are trying to, you know, hold too much of this narrative in our own self, I feel like that we're going to, there will be an opportunity by the end of today to really address this um, within ourselves as the moon crosses the galactic center. Because what are we here for, especially as star seeds, right? We're here to be here for the mission. What's the mission? The transition in, um, in spiritual consciousness and the human consciousness into the galact, you know, into the next phase, right? Um, the harmonic, we've already identified it. It's going to come forward in a very physical way, um, during this year and whatever that looks like it is coming. And if we are attempting to hold all of it, um, in order to really identify with some sort of narrative, I feel like that, um, <clears throat> 
we're going to lose an opportunity to actually create something very new, right? So the moon's going to move into Capricorn by the very end of today and by tomorrow we'll be in Capricorn. And um, that means it's going to trine the sun in Taurus. It's going to trine Uranus. Um, and eventually it'll trine um, the North Node. It's going to square Chiron. So, uh, and, 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 um, Lots of sextiles to all of the Pisces energy. So there, uh, by the by, tomorrow the moon will uh, allow us to get a lot more serious about what's going on within us and really taking some responsibility for that and seeing what needs to be done in order to um, have something unfold right within us. And. <sighs> It's just, it's important to just be yourself. Use your um, feelings, whatever they are, as the guidepost. You don't identify with them, you know. If you're angry, you don't necessarily reinforce to yourself, hey, I am angry. You may, um, you know, re reframe that. I feel anger and this is what I feel anger about. This is a different and this is different than saying I am angry because then you never not. How could you ever not be angry if you identify yourself with a feeling rather than your isness as a spiritual and sacred, um, you know, piece of the source, right? That is what you are. That is what I am. Everything else is an experience. Um, and part of the, all this Taurus energy now is the environment in which we eventually have that experience of consciousness. So I'm going to leave it there, my friends, for today. Thank you for joining me. I appreciate every single one of you. If you are interested in a reading or energy work to support your process through this time, you can find all of the links that you need in the description box below, including the website, including um, the Starseed Fellowship through Subscribestar, um, and a number of other resources for you. So please take care of yourself. Take care of each other as best you can. I'll see you tomorrow for the daily. Have a great day. Bye, guys. Oh. Mm -hmm.